So it's great to be back here. Uh, as John said, we've been doing this for a while. I've been involved for the last, uh, this will be the fifth year. And I want to take you through the world that I see and how it impacts and what we, how it impacts the aftermarket uh, industry and what we've been doing to try and bring some of that OEM grade um, type of tools and engineering to, to benefit you. Many of you might have seen diagrams like this, right? It's, it's, it's a vehicle, but what you see are all the electronic subsystems in the vehicle. And uh, you know, each of those little colored boxes represents some control system, uh, whether it be something major in the powertrain or vehicle dynamics or safety to uh, purely consumer-driven uh, um, comfort feature type things and all the networks that connect. And so that's the world that my company, DSpace, uh, lives in. Uh, what, what we are is, what we feel is we're one of the leading providers of tools for developing those embedded controls uh, for the creation, the invention, the prototyping, uh, the simulation side, what we've been talking about, the actual um, software engineering, the actual software that goes into those vehicles that go into mass production, and finally vehicle calibrations to tune it to the exact uh, feature set and uh, feel and comfort that you want. And apart from the automotive industry, we also play in, apart from passenger car and pickup trucks and so forth, we play across a lot of different industries from the commercial vehicles all the way to aerospace. The picture of the F-35, I've you know, personally had a chance to work with a lot of the suppliers on that and uh, so very cool programs that we get to work on. So I have a good graphic here that represents vehicle complexity from an electronics perspective. And, and later on, you'll see why I'm putting this up. So this was uh, authored by BMW. They wanted to represent, from an electronics and software perspective, how complex is a modern-day vehicle. And this was 2007. The automotive industry has actually gone through further you know, innovations that, have, that compound this picture even more. And so this is dependencies between ECUs, these electronic control units. So the figure on the left is dependencies if you think about things that that controller is doing, just on a single controller, between a couple of controllers, and for an entire vehicle. So one feature implemented on one controller is typically not in isolation. It is normally participating in a system level function, and there are these links that tie them all together. Highly intricate, highly complex. And this is a very large challenge for an average automaker and supplier to deal with. But this is what you folks have to contend with. This is, this is, these are the vehicles that you're designing aftermarket products for. And electronics today, as you well know, is no longer, they're no longer just helper functions. They, the major functions of the vehicle are commanded, supervised, and authored by electronics. So, how do OEMs handle this? Uh, you've heard a lot about simulation, a lot of simulation. That's the answer. Uh, simulation is used, first of all, in the development of requirements. We want to launch a new system in this vehicle. How do we understand what the system can do, where are the boundaries going to be, and how much scope do we have to actually engineer something that hits a, a desired feature that marketing is defining? Early vehicles. Uh, early development, before prototype vehicles exist. Prototype vehicles are very expensive. Uh, so the development of strategies in that virtual world that uh, Dr. Gillespie talked about. And then also validation. You, all those electronics, it's millions and millions of light of code. You want to test that in some form before you actually test on a real vehicle. Not just because it's less expensive, but fundamentally you want the control of a test so you can vary every single factor and you can exhaustively test software. So they use a lot of simulation and they use a lot of what we are referring to, hardware in the loop simulation. And to give you a picture of what an OEM lab, okay, actually, let me go back. I'll, uh, so let me define what HIL is. So what are we talking about? So you might have things on the vehicle, whether it be the entire vehicle or components and engine, motors and so forth, and you have the electronics that control them. And so HIL, simply put, is taking mathematical models, like what Dr. Gillespie talked about, running them on a real-time computer, but it's more than a computer. It contains all of the capability 
to run that math in real time um, and s emulate all of the signals and network communication and all of the characteristics of real systems and be able to connect to controllers. So the controller does not know it's not in the real vehicle. And then you can test it for everything that it's been designed to do and been designed not to do. And of course, going from single controllers that might control a component to all of the controllers or subsystems, a powertrain, engine, transmission, and so forth. And a, a bench at an, at an automotive OEM for testing an entire vehicle, a lab might look like this. You know, 70 to 100 controllers representing an entire platform. These are just six racks. I've seen labs which have 12 and so forth. All of the electronics and so this is a tremendous amount of complexity and this is, this is the type of know-how that we've been bringing you for the last four years, four or five years, is how do you bring this know-how and apply it for, for the aftermarket space. So we talked about electronic stability control. This is just a one representative diagram of that control system and without going through, there are a whole bunch of inputs um, here. This laser pointer works. A whole bunch of inputs here that feed into this, this al these algorithms and then outputs are generated. What to do? What are the brakes supposed to do? Should the engine reduce torque? What messages go to other controllers? And there's a lot of interaction with other systems. And that's, that's where the, the key complexity comes in. It's not just the complexity of that control system, it's, it's how does it interact with other systems. So for part of this presentation, I got a lot of supporting material from one of uh, our OEM partners, uh, Jim Hollowell at Chrysler, so I'm acknowledging his input in this, because he also gave me the OEM perspective of what are the things that are impacted. So in the, in the SEMA context, what did we do? So we have the ESC system, it's got sensors, it's reading in data, it's, this is a typical vehicle, and it's commanding something, and that loop is closed around the vehicle operation, so a vehicle, and the ESC system is controlling the behavior of this vehicle. So our goal was replace the vehicle, um, that behavior of the vehicle with a simulator and talk to the controls. Uh, so how we managed to do that was we hooked up a simulator to an actual vehicle. We cut out those components or we intercepted those components which would be, uh, and then simulated them. So for example, we simulated sensors and certain actuators and so forth and figured out what the controls would do and use this to develop test cases, run the 126 maneuvers, determine how would this vehicle behave. We, that method allowed us to preserve the majority of the vehicle, all of the brake hydraulics and everything like that, so we got maximum realism out of that. And we ran this, we ran it for the Ford, we ran it for the, uh, the BDS um, RAM, we also did a project for IBOX suspension, actually in this case a lowering kit, and in each case, got to run whatever test profiles we wanted and, and gather a quali quantitative set of data. So this is running at Link Engineering. Um, this was the RAM uh, from BDS. And as you can see, that's Jim Hollowell from Chrysler. I showed this video last year. So it's actually running through a scenario. And if you hear the truck brakes going off in the back, the truck, all the truck electronics think it's running in the real, in the real world. And Jim is running the exact instrumentation he would at a Chrysler proving track, and we can get comparative data and compare it to, you know, data extracted from physical testing. So how good is the simulation? Here's a graph that is actual physical data for that truck from Chelsea Proving Grounds, um, and this this part of this particular sequence in the 126 uh, test sequence is one of the most extremes. So what would be characterized as a very high dynamic maneuver, uh, a very extreme steering angle over a short period of time. And if you look at the, some of these key uh, air, uh, pieces of information, we have the steering wheel angle, we have the yaw rate of the vehicle, and we have lateral acceleration. If we look at the simulated data, you see the comparisons. There might be some differences which might lead us to tweak the model. But fundamentally, we're looking at those levels of vehicle behavior. And then what's not shown here is we're also looking at, for example, the brake pressures that are applied. And how, in, how much within the range of capability of the ESC controller does this modification um, you know, impact? 
And so this is for the baseline vehicle, but we're able to get very good data, very well correlated in the simulation environment. And even look, this just points out a couple of knee points in the data, which have a unique dynamic behavior of the vehicle, and we're able to simulate that exact same artifact uh, with the HL environment. So this is, this is just a, it's a video captured from an actual HL test. And you'll see at the end of this braking maneuver on a split mu surface, a lot of artifacts of that vehicle. So you see each of those little bounces and jounces and so forth are the effect of electronics trying to mitigate that. And that's the real electronics in the vehicle. So that's what we're able to do. So I don't want you to read through this whole thing, but these, this is our list of features that are dependent on the ESC controller. And they go all the way from adaptive cruise control to forward collision warning, very big coming up in possible future legislature, to all sorts of other features that are dependent. So it's not an isolated system. And changing anything that affects, that is fundamentally connected to ESC impacts these as well. And we talk about trailer sway control. Here's an example of an HL test back to back where a fault of another system caused the ESC system to shut off, and you see the impact because trailer sway control is dependent on ESC functioning. So there are other features also dependent on ESC behavior that you might not think of. Fuel economy is a big, big deal. It'll drive a lot of product development, innovation, and automotive. So engine start-stop, micro-hybrids. OEMs are rolling this across the board, across all their product lines. And ESC is intimately tied into engine start-stop. And so are also some high-performance features. Uh, your world, uh, the OEMs are also looking to see how can we integrate more performance-oriented features, such as auto rev matching and so forth. And so these are also tied to ESC controls. And so these next few slides are just talk about ESC, ESP, depending on the manufacturer, call, they use the same different acronyms. They have a lot of tuning. And the tuning is done at a system level. So anything that's tied to that, the, those parameters go into the software, and at the factory, all of that is tuned. So any deviation from those, to those pieces, those components that affect any of that tuning can have an impact. And beyond 126, the impact can be by impacting some of those other features that consumers are paying for. So if you have a high-end vehicle that is being modified and that customer has paid for an adaptive cruise control system or an auto park assist or something like that, and ride height changes those radar sensors, then, then there's going to be an impact there. And a consumer is not going to be happy if some of those high cost features are being impacted in an adverse way. But, and, and one thing is that some of these warning lights sometimes are nuisances, but they can actually lead to what I refer to here as ECU functional shutdown, where something actually shuts down. And, and, and that can have a cascading exponential effect on, on, in terms of drivability of the vehicle. So beyond this doom and gloom, there's, there's definitely, my purpose was not to say, hey, these are all the you know, bad things that could happen. There's certainly an opportunity to engineer aftermarket products and have visibility of how, what the impact will be. And that's where we feel HIL really benefits. I think it comes in early in the process. I think uh, folks like Link have been able to drive the cost down significantly, do that physical testing, something that you might need for actually validation of your uh, parts for 126, but this comes in, I believe, early to be able to cover a scope, to be able to uh, look at what is the DNA of the vehicle that you want to create. I borrowed this graphic from Mandar. And how does that vehicle or system interaction, um, how, does it impact, how does it interact with the vehicle that you're intending to design a part for? And how do you meet that intended design from an electronics perspective? Uh, how does it impact safety systems? things that you should know early in your design, and design a product that fits into the boundary of those factory systems. And then finally, that when your product goes on that vehicle, that your consumers are not getting things like you would refer to as nuisance activations, warning lamps, things like that, and ensures a more integrated, uh, smooth uh, product rollout. So I think that was it for me.